Hello. In this next video, we're going to be talking about chapter 8, which is um, enzymes as catalysts. And so we're actually going to talk a little bit about thermodynamics. It's just a very high, high overview of it, so it's not a big deal, uh, as well as some, um, some basics of enzyme kinetics, um, stuff like that, as well as uh, inhibitors, stuff like that. So enzymes, all they do is they are like any other sort of chemical catalyst. They just speed it up. It just so happens to be that they're made by uh, they're made out of proteins but they function no differently than than any other sort of chemical catalyst they they do the reaction they don't get used up something like that so but they can have a pretty dramatic effect on the speed of a reaction so like that so a reaction that may take years to to complete can be done in and with the use of an enzyme be done in in, in seconds um so like that so it really is amazing um what they can do um, so there's, um, so one of the things about it is that the uh, the enzymes themselves are very specific for a reaction type. Okay, so the names are typically, you know, this part of the name is going to tell you what it what it works on. So like protease is just a protein ace. And ace just means that it's an enzyme. So it's an enzyme that works on proteins. So it'll, it'll clip a protein. Um, triose phosphorase isomerase, right? So it's um, the um, it forms the isomer. It's an enzyme that, that works on an isomer, right? So it's going to move that the double bond over here and then the OH there. So, so you move that double bond from here to there, um, stuff like that. So you just make an isomer. So like that's so a nuclease, right? So it's a, nucleat, a nucleic acid ace, right? So, so it works on nucleic acids. Um, so it'll clip this. Now, what do you mean by specific? Is that you're not going to have a nuclease do this is isomerization, um, stuff like that, you know, the nuclease can be, um, we'll talk about this in a second, the specificity, what it works on is is um, maybe the um, maybe broad, maybe narrow, stuff like that, but the uh, um, stuff like that, but the reaction type is going to be very specific, um, stuff like that. And so for specificity, this is how, you know, what sorts of substrates can you do. Um, so if you have a low substrate specificity, so if you have a, a protease right, that clips um, or hydrolyzes peptide bonds, right? So if you have trypsin, okay, it'll cleave simply after an ar any arginine or any lysine. So if there's an ar the arginine here, it's going to clip there. Doesn't matter what you know what's over here. So by that, so if you see an arginine clip, that's it. So by that, however, thrombin, it's another protease, but it's very very specific that it only cleaves between an arginine and glycine bond. So it has to be an arginine here, glycine here. It's going to clip there and nowhere else. You can also see this with broad, so if you uh, with nucleases as well. So if you have just a regular DNA, it'll just chop DNA randomly. But if you have a restriction enzyme, it's going to target a very, very specific amino acid or a protein or excuse me uh, DNA sequence, something like that. So okay, so enzymes, however, you know they're they're built up of mostly proteins, right? So like that, but sometimes they do need help, and you can have. Um, different cofactors, cofactors. So you can either have small molecule cofactors, or you can have um, metal cofactors. The uh, um, uh, these small molecules are sometimes called coenzymes, something like that. And so they're just they can either be these metals, or or the uh, um, or small molecules. So with that, so if you have an enzyme that that would normally have a cofactor but doesn't this point it's what's called an apoenzyme so if it would normally have um, this thiamine pyrophosphate so if you had a pyrite decarboxylase that didn't have a thi thiamine pyrophosphate attached uh, you know embedded within it it would we would call that the apo form or apoenzyme form um, okay so we're going to talk about thermodynamics so just bear with me it's very short um, so about that so we're just going to very high um, high level overview of this Okay, so it's all about delta G, so the Gibbs free energy. Okay, it's it's a chain. It is um, the change, and and the universe is inherently um, lazy, right? It wants to go f um, to a lower energy state. That's what it w always wants to do. So if you track the reaction, so the energy um, from where you started, okay, to the energy where you ended, right? So like that. So the um, it's if it goes down. Okay, so for that, so it's going to go to a lower energy state, right? So the uh, um, so that means that the reaction is spontaneous. Now, spontaneous is not equal fast. So the way that I remember this is if, right? If you think about if so, if this is time, okay, and this is your checking account balance, 
okay? You start off high, right, when you get paid, and then somehow it just spontaneously drops. I don't know how it does it, but it's really hard. So if you just give it time, it'll just drop magically, right? But for some reason, it doesn't really want to go up very often. Um, so, about that. So, you're, you, so you can always think of your checking account balance. Um, that's usually what I do. Now, one thing is, uh, so this is spontaneous, so this reaction is, but it has nothing to do with speed. Okay, spontaneous and fast are two different things. That's why they've been, I think, trying to get to this exergonic and endergonic, um, no, you know, sort of the uh, um, terms, stuff like that. So, because spontaneous, not fast. So the classic example is our diamonds. Okay, so the classic De Beers ad is diamonds are forever. Well, actually, they aren't. They are thermodynamically unstable. They will turn back into a lump. Of, of graphite, if so about that. But the thing is, it's not going to happen very often, right? So about that. So so the delta G is definitely going down here, right? So this is diamond and this is graphite. It's going to go here. The problem is, the it's going to be incredibly slow. It may take a billion years, okay? But it's not forever. So about that. So um, so spontaneous, fast, two different things. Okay? So by that, so if it's so if delta G is equal to zero, these reactions are equilibrium. It doesn't care if it's in the the substrate or product form, okay. But if you have, but if delta G is is um, greater than zero, okay. So you start off here and you end up up here at, at the final product. That's bad. So by that, so right, it, it's just not gonna. It, it, um, nature does not want that reaction to happen. It actually wants to be back in the substrate form. So that because it's going to be lower energy. Okay. Now the thing is about delta G is it does not care how you get there. It's just all it measures is here and there and the gap between them. That doesn't matter, right? So but that so you know the uh, you know if you you're taking a trip from DC to LA, okay. Delta G does not care how you get there, right? You can walk, you can fly, you can ride a unicycle. Doesn't matter. Okay, all it's going to care is you went from DC, you started off in, you know, DC, you ended up in LA. Okay, it doesn't care how, if it took you a month or a day, right? So like that, so you took, you know, via Canada or via Mexico or you went the other way around the world. Doesn't matter. Delta G is, just does not care, okay? It's like the honey badger, just doesn't care. Um, it, it's just from point A to point B, what's the difference, okay? When you start getting into this, so the, the, the part in between here, that's when you're going to be talking about speed and, and enzymes and thermodynamics and things like that. And so um, delta G is just here, okay? But there's a lot of important stuff that happens in between, okay? And so what, the, uh, what you have to look at next is, is what's called the transition state, okay? So what happens is you're starting off here, okay? And then as you're getting things into the right orientation, you're starting to, to move things into the right space, you know, things are binding, things are, bonds are getting in the right orientation, that's going to cost some money, right? That's going to cost some energy, right? You have to, what is it, the old adage, you have to spend a little money to win money, right? You have to buy that dollar lottery ticket in order to be able to get the $10 payoff, right? So, uh, so, the, so you, have, you have to spend a little money, okay, to, to get over here. So, so you've got to spend a little energy. Okay, and the highest point that you go here, so the, the gap between where you started from and this highest point, that's what's called the transition state. Um, so that, or the excuse me, the um, the activation energy. That's how. We, so this right here, this highest point right here, that's what's called the transition state. That that's the sort of weird high energy intermediate. You can't isolate it, okay, but you can sort of detect it um, that it's that it's forming. Okay, so about that. So, but activation energy—that—that's the how much energy it takes to go over the um, the highest hill. Okay, it can be the first one, or it can be the second one, or the third one. It doesn't matter. It's whatever the highest hill is. You can sort of think about when you're climbing up Mount Everest, right? If you started here, right? Nobody cares if you, you know, nobody. Ooh, I I climbed over three small hills before I climbed Mount Everest, right? Nobody's going to care about these things. It's the climbing of the Mount Everest that that makes the, you know that everybody wants to hear about. Okay, well that's all that matters is this is getting over this highest hill because you got to get over that highest hump in order to be able to get it done. Okay. So what enzymes do is they is they provide an alternate path. You can either think of you, you drop the height of the hill. Okay, you can sort of either think about that, or the other way you can do is the hill's still there, but what you're going to do is you're going to tunnel through it. 
right? So instead of having to go all the way over, you're going to go through it. So you can think of it as, as either one, um, either way. They're, they're equally valid, right? To be able to either you drop this hill or you go through the hill. So about that. But the other uh, is this: you don't need as much energy to get through it, which means it's sped up, right? So about that. So because it doesn't take nearly as much time to get over the hill. Okay, that's thermodynamics. Okay, not too bad. You guys survived. It's okay. Okay, so next up, where does all this happen? Okay, so it happens in the active site. That's where actually all the chemistry is. So it, you have what's called the enzyme substrate complex. So, so the enzyme, where does the, the substrate get in there? Okay, so how do they, they sort of get together? Okay, so there's going to be some sort of like specific part of the protein that, that you have that's the interesting thing. So in this case, this is what's called cytochrome P450. This is involved in... Um, in metabolism of, of of compounds in your body, so about that. So it's part of the clear clearance thing. Um, you, there's no reason to do the those at the cleanses and things like that. Um, that's what the P450s are for. If you need to do that sort of stuff, talk to your doctor because otherwise uh, that means some things are there. But don't waste your money on was it detox things or whatever things like that. Your P450, your cytochrome P450s, they're going to do just fine. Um, things don't build up in there. Okay, the active site is just sort of a cleft or a crevice in that protein fold, um, but and, it, and it's just going to involve a small number of, of um, amino acids. Okay, so here's your so that's in the cytochrome P450. Oh, by the way, the P450 comes from the fact that um, it absorbs at 340 nanometers in the UV spectrum. Um, so really, just these amino acid side chains are, are the important ones, along with this. But all of this other stuff, all these other proteins are there to get these in the correct position okay so you have to have you know sort of you have to have this loop so that this this tyrosine is is right here and it's right so that it can be in the right orientation if it was like hanging out over here instead you wouldn't be able to get um good um this the camphor in this in this case the substrate wouldn't be able to get into there and be held very tightly um stuff like that and so it's all of this bulk protein is there just to make sure that these few get in the correct position. Okay, so the active site is going to be unique in the uh, in in the sort of environment, the overall you know your overall test tube when things like that. So even though usually you run these things in water, right? So like that, so it's some sort of buffer. So like that, you may have what's like a little tiny hydrophobic pocket right into that protein. So if you have a hydrophobic molecule, so in this case like camphor, that, that's fairly hydrophobic, it's gonna see that little hydro, that little greasy spot and it's gonna say, I want to get in there. Um, stuff like that, right? Because grease wants to be in with grease. Stuff like that. So the other thing, um, stuff like that, so you have a hydrophobic spot inside of this water, right? So for that, the other thing is you, you do want the, the substrate to bind. You do want it to get into the active site, but you don't want to be held too tightly. Stuff like that, because what can happen is you can you get it in there, once it turns into into product, you want it to leave, right? So for that, so you don't necessarily want it to be really, really held tightly. You want it to get in there, do its business, and then get out. So the uh, um, okay, so about that. So the way this works with, with the active site is there's a there's a couple of different ways, and so a couple of very simplistic ways of looking at this, this is much more complicated. But I think. Um, so the original idea was that this is what's called a lock and key mechanism. Okay, so you have an active site, it's got a specific substrate that it wants to do just like it's got a specific key, and then this is going to fit very tightly. Right, so this fits there, that fits there, and that fits there. Okay, the other thing you could do is you could can have an induced fit where they, they don't line up directly, but as it's coming in here, the molecule sort of molds itself. So the, uh, this would be more like a, uh, what is it, the... Uh, the the mattresses that sort of like the you know, that sort of conform to your body stuff like that so you know it's flat as soon as you get on there kind of you know the uh, moves around or whatever it is so compresses where it's supposed to be um, stuff like that so that's what's called an induced fit um, that that's the way you can do it so, so what's happening is when that substrate gets in there okay you're gonna have some very positive it's usually a lot of hydrogen bonding that's very good um, so like that as well as van der Waals interactions maybe there's some charge Thing, um, some some the yeah, charge interactions as well, um, but th it's going to be very optimized for that. Uh, it may be so like that. So also the other thing helping out is, is don't forget that there's an entropic part of of um, the delta G equation. So like that. So what can happen is if there's there, there can sometimes be water 
uh, hanging out in the active site if the substrate's not there, that that can get thrown into bulk solvent, um, stuff like that. And so entropically, that's very favorable. You go from a very organized system, you know, that water being held in a place to a, a sort of a chaotic sort of bulk system, stuff like that. So, so of the of the outer water, stuff like that. That's very good. So that can help drive your delta G. And it, it's all of these interactions. Um, so with that, so both the binding and the, the entropy issues, those are all going to help, you know, provide the energy to be able to lower that, um, the activation energy. So with that, so you got to get the energy from somewhere, okay? Okay. Reaction kinetics. Okay, so now this is, again, going to be a very high, high overview for this. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I'm sure your college is going to have a, um, a, a, enzymes kinetics course um stuff like that so but this is just a sort of an intro so that, um later on we can talk about um you know kcat km and what they what they mean and, and different things like this but we need to talk about reaction kinetics now so like that so bear with me um so like that and, but again it's just like with the thermodynamics it's going to be sort of a high level overview for this okay so like that so okay so think back general chemistry we were talking about um reaction the uh, um reaction kinetics okay just for a simple chemical reaction right you're going from substrate to product okay so the product so the reaction velocity is just literally saying the change in concentration over time so this is molar so moles per moles per liter right over change right so it's the change in concentration over time that's all we're looking at how much of this are we making or how much of this are we losing okay so it's how much of you know so how much of this are we losing over time or how much we're making this over um, a certain amount of time that's all that is okay so and it's going to be proportional so the rate of the reaction so the velocity of the reaction kind of thing of it's it's going to be proportional to the concentration of a right so like that so if we have more a then it, it should go faster um, so like that and so the classic rate equation is this so velocity is equal to some rate constant okay, times the concentration of your substrate. Okay, for this this type of reaction, if you have a first order reaction, you just have one substrate. It goes in, does its thing, out it goes, no big deal. So it's just going to be dependent on this uh, this concentration. Um, so the equation is going to be this. Remember, so um, for that, so if you have a second order equation, right? So you have two substrates. So you can either have an A and B substrate, or you can have two A's coming together. Um, you know that, and so the rate equations would be like the A and B. This. So in this case, it would be both of these, so concentration of this, concentration of this. For this one, again, it's going to be concentration of that, concentration of that, but since it was the same, we can just square it. Okay, now the, the, the units for the, the rate equation, all they're really there to do is to make it so that after you cancel out all the units, you're left with molar per second, right? So this is molar, um, stuff like that, so you, and this needs to be molar per second, so this better be per second. Here, it's molar, molar, okay? So we need the second down here, but we also need to cancel one of these molars for the units, so we're left with molar, moles per unit, or moles per second. So that, that, that's all that is. You generally don't have, um, you know, third order. So with that, so because it's sort of a three-body problem, right? So if you have a, if you think of a car rack, right? Because remember, these things have to, you know, knock into each other. You usually don't have three cars colliding at the same time. Usually what happens is it's two cars collide, and at some point later, whether it's 10 seconds later or a minute later, a third one comes in and smashes into it, um, stuff like that. So it's, it's usually not three things happening because it's very, very unlikely. It's usually two things coming in and then a third one coming in later, um, stuff like that. So that's going to change it. So, so that's why you don't typically see uh, third order kinetics, um, stuff like that but, you know, that, but in our simplistic model, I should say. Okay. Now... What we typically use is this michaelis metten uh, uh, model for this, right? So Lenoir uh, Michaelis and then Maud, Maud Metten, stuff like that. So she was um, the, um, the um, um, so they worked together, stuff like that. So most people don't realize that Maud uh, Metten of this was a, was a woman, stuff like that. So I want to show you guys. So the, uh, um, so what they said is, okay, we're going to do a, a very sim simple model for this. Okay, and when we still teach it because it still seems to work pretty well. Okay, okay. So the basic equation for a reaction, right, is going to be you've got an enzyme and you got a substrate. They come together to make this enzyme-substrate complex, right? So, so it's just the enzyme and the substrate coming together and binding. Okay. Now, 
then a reaction happens, okay, the product leaves, and then you're left with an enzyme and that can come back and do the reaction again. Okay? And if you look at the equation, right, so these two things come in together, make the enzyme complex, that's one rate. How often does that happen? The other thing that can happen is this just the substrate just doesn't react and just falls it just falls apart. That, that that's some rate and that's K minus one. So so this is the forward, that's the reverse reaction. Okay. If this comes in and decides to make product, right, the rate at which this is formed, okay, would be the uh, um, the K2, right? So for that, so the uh, uh, and so the rate at which product is formed. Okay. Now this could this a lot of these reactions can go backwards, and so the product can come in, you know, might be able to bind to this, and and then the uh, and then make this substrate again. That can that can technically happen. But what they notice is that if you increase the substrate concentration, okay, you're you know just like normal um, kinetics, right? It's gonna the reaction is gonna go faster, okay, to a point, okay. So the over time product rate is gonna go the um, it's gonna go faster, and you can make more product. What Michaelis and Menten said is that look, let's let's simplify this down. Okay, so let's say we're just going to look at what's called initial rates. So that's when we don't have a whole lot of, of product around. So this is, um, so K, K minus 2, so where you're going back here, that, that's negligible, right? Because we just simply don't have any product, um, stuff like that. So in order to be able to go with this reaction backwards, it simplifies things bec uh, it, it quite a bit, okay? And so the rate of the reaction is actually just simply... Um, at this initial point, is how fast can you get this to make product? That's it. Um, so like that, and so this is what's called the initial um, rate of product formation. So the initial rate, um, so like that, is this can, um, this um, constant rate constant, okay, times the enzyme con enzyme um, substrate complex concentration, okay. And what they noticed is that if you do these plots at different um, different concentrations. If you look at the initial velocity, if you look at like the initial rate for these things, where you just the, the initial part of this, you can get this curve. So substrate versus initial reaction velocity, you get this curve here. Okay. And so what they did is they said, okay. Um, and then the the book goes into this um, right. So, so then it's oh okay, here before I start that. So then it's sort of like okay, we got to figure out how how do we measure this. Well, what well, what they said is okay. So we're we're having what is this, um, the uh, we're going to say okay. So how do we make this? Well, that's K one. Okay. So the as as fast as this is made, it then we're going to say that it degrades. So the rate of it getting formed is equal to the rate at which it it goes away and there's two ways it can go away it can either go away back to make this or it can make product okay so you're saying that the formation of the of the ES is equal to the it's the um, it's breakdown okay so like that so the, the book goes into this really complex um, things it's pretty cool um, stuff like that of how you sort of do the calculations I, I'm your eye, if I walk you through this, your eyes are going to glaze over and, and you're going to stop listening. Um, so like that. But take a look at it. It's, a, it's very, you know, it's actually pretty slick how they, how they went through this. But at the end of the day, you know, there's lots of math. There's, there's lots of, um, math involved. They came up with this equation, and this is the michaelis menten equation. Okay. So what does this mean? Okay. So the initial rate. Okay, so that's the rate, to, uh, like the first little bit of the reaction, okay, is equal to some maximum rate, so V max, okay, maximum rate times the substrate um, over the sum of the substrate and this Km, which is the Michaelis uh, constant, okay. So, for that, so, okay, so, so that, that's this is, and so what you end up with is um, this curve. So, if you measure, if you, at varying, Enzyme con or substrate concentrations. Okay, you, in you measure the initial rate. You end up getting this sort of curve. So the asymptote for this would end up being um, V max. Okay, so what happens? Okay, so, so if the so at some point the cat you know the substrate if the substrate is way concentration for that is much 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 higher than Km. Okay, of this mechanical spent the Km becomes unimportant. So let's say that's that's 100. You know, you know. So let's say these are 100, and then that's one. Okay, so 100 over 
100 over 101 is basically 1, right? So that that so so it, that really becomes unimportant. Okay, so we you actually get you know so, so if that goes away, you end up with this, and so well that cancels, and so you end up getting this. So at very very high concentrations, um, you get the initial velocity is going to be the V max. Okay, so as long as you're well above the concentration of the Michaelis constant. Okay, and basically what's happening is the reaction is waiting on the catalyst. It cannot go any faster, right? So that that's so the uh, uh, you can put more substrate in there. It's not going to go any faster, right? So that that so th that's what that's going right. So if you go into right, so if you go to uh, a shopping mall or you go into a, sh a store and they've got you know three checkout people, stuff like that. So if you put in if you try to have you know, a hundred people go to going through, you know, check out at the same time, it's not going to mean any um, faster right? or, you know, than if, than if six people were trying to, uh, to get through the line at once. So but that's, so the, uh, um, so you just try, you've basically saturated the, uh, the, the enzyme. Okay. Now the other thing is, so let's say the substrate concentration is equal to the, um, to KM. Okay. So let's say you get into this magical, ability to do this well something else weird happens okay so substrate so if this is equal to that then well we can just change that to s this collapses down to here once you um, which allows you to cancel this and so what you end up with is the initial rate at half the max velocity that's the Michaelis um, that's km okay which works out well because you can say well what's what's v max well um, when do you know what it is? Well, so for that, is it 90%? Is it 99%? Is it 99.9% of, of this? We don't know. We know where half is. It's going to be that, and that's a lot easier to, to measure. Okay. So it's the constant. So KM is actually the, the concentration at which the reaction is going at half speed. Okay. So KM is going to give you a, a measure of how efficient the, the substrate binds to the enzyme. Okay, so if you have a high con if KM is high, you have a high it means you have to have a high concentration in order for the reaction to go at half speed. If you have a low KM, okay, that means you only need a little a, a small concentration to, to get it to go really fast. And so the idea is um, this is a poor binding that that's that's high binding. So if you have a ten if your KM is say ten micromolar, um, that means you know compared to ten nanomolar, right, that this binding is gonna be much more efficient than, than this one. Okay. Now, how do we figure this out, right? So, so the way that you can do this is um, anymore, you all you do is you simply um, plot this, um, stuff like that, and then you can use um, things like Excel or Sigma Plot or Prism, whatever. You can use software to do it, and that's actually probably the best way to do it, just looking at the raw data. Before they had that, they had what are called Line Weaver Burke plots, um, stuff like that, and it's and there's a lot of different ways you can do these things. And basically, the joke is that you either do inverses or log natural logs until you get a straight line <laughs> on your on your data. The problem with this is since it's you're inversing it, all of your high concentration data, where you typically get better better numbers, are going to be way down here. It, your high concentration, because or your low concentration, where you're you know, because remember this is one over. Um, so that is going to be out here, and this is where you get a lot of, um, you know, there's usually a lot of error, and so this can disproport the so the low concentration stuff can disproportionately affect what it is, and so the errors at low concentration have a bigger bearing than, than there, right? Because at high concentrations, you're, they're all going to be down here, and then low concentration can be out here, so it can kind of screw this up. Um, but ideal world, right? So where this x-intercept is, it's one over v max. Where the um, where it hits I'm excuse me, where it hits the y, um, that's the the one over v max. Where it hits the x, that's where one um, negative um, one over km. So it works pretty. I mean, it does work well, um, but anymore you just use Excel or something like that. Okay. Now, an efficiency for catalysis. Okay, so how well does the reaction you know actually do the reaction? Okay, that's measured by the turnover number, and so that's typically k cat. And so, notice how it's a little, uh, it's a little k. The km is a uh, um, the uh, uh, is a large is a um, capital K because it's a binding constant. Um, so it has, so it's it's an equal um, the uh, but this one k cat is more of a kinetic, so it's usually 
it's given a, a small k, um, stuff like that. So what we do is we say, okay, um, the uh, um, so if we want to know what this is, it's just Vmax. We run the reaction Vmax, and then over enzyme concentration, right? You you can measure how much enzyme you you could put into your you know into that, and so you can get kcat out. And so this is um, molar molar per second, right? That's molar. So it's molar per second divided by molar, and molars cancel out. And so you're left is how many reactions happen per second, okay? So for carbonic anhydrase, it can do 600,000. One en one enzyme can do um, 600,000 reactions per second, okay? So with that, so, so DNA polymerase, one can do 15 reactions per second. Lysozyme can do half a reaction a second. Um, so with that, so that's that's what we do. I typically look at, at KCAT, but you know, so but the, but what you can do is you can look at KCAT over KM, and that's sort of an efficient, sort of an efficiency of of um, sort of the, that's what it's important. You have to be careful with this because what you can do um, when you're looking at this, the uh, if you just have something that binds really really tightly, you can get a very good efficiency. Um, so the um, so you have to be careful. The uh, um, but it's if you're looking at substrates like this, right? You can see, oh, hey, valine. If you look at um, this KCAT over KM, right? This is two with phenylalanine, right? It's it's um, right a hundred thousand, right? So so it's it's substantially faster, you know. So with that, a more efficient of a reaction for, for phenylalanine as opposed to recognize cutting after lysine or valine, excuse me. Um, so with that, so it does, however, show you if something is um, diffusion limited. So literally, if if you're in that sort of ten to the eight, ten to the seventh, ten to the eighth, ten to the ninth um, kcat over km, what that means is that the enzyme is waiting for the substrate to actually get into uh, into the binding site. It's just diffusing through the buffer to get in there. As soon as it gets in, it reacts and, and leaves. So like that. So the uh, um, so the enzyme is actually waiting around, even though there's a lot of um, substrate around. It's it it is waiting around. So the um, so things like acetylcholinesterase, carbonic anhydrase, these guys, um, catalase, these things work incredibly fast. So okay. So for substrates, okay. So, so there's a couple of different ways that, that you can do this, um, and this is just two of them. Uh, one of them being just sort of like sequential reactions, right? So you've got a cofactor and a uh, and a substrate. They bind, all right. So cofactor may bind first, and then the uh, and then the pyruvate. Okay, they react, slide over here, and then oh, we've got product, and then those release. Okay, so these things come together, boom, bing, they react, come over here like this. So that is just a sequential reaction, not a big deal. So you need two substrates that need to get hooked together, or you have a substrate and a cofactor, you know. Things like that. It's, it's the um, this is what you would normally think about, but you can also have um, what are called double displacement and affectionately known as ping pong um, reactions. Okay, and basically what it's doing is is in this reaction here, it really only it's it's transferring this part this um, amine group here, it's transferring it over here to this to this carbon. Okay, so what happens is this uh, um, this aspartate and the um, comes in here and it literally rips that um, the the amine away and throw and you know throws the product this oxaloacetate away. So it's basically this molecule lacking the the amine. Okay. Then the enzyme comes in and binds this one, slaps this in, um, puts the nitrogen here, and then releases um, the glutam uh, the glutamine. Okay. So you can sort of think of it like you're making a banana split, right? You have a whole banana here, right? All you care about is the inside, right? So you, you peel the banana, throw that away, and you're only left with this one part, and then you shove that into your ice cream, right, to make your banana split, okay? So, so that's what's happening is you do one reaction, and then you transfer part of that, and then you do another, you do another react type of reaction over here. And those are, that's what's called ping pong reaction, ping pong um, kinetics. Okay, last topic, inhibitors. Okay, there's two different types of inhibitors two general classes, one's called reversible, other one's irreversible. And the only difference between the two is uh, reversible means you don't make a covalent bond, while irreversible means you're gonna covalently attach your molecule to it. 
um, stuff like that. So, so those are the two general classes. Now you can break that down uh, for the reversible inhibitors to um, to competitive, uncompetitive, and non-competitive. Okay, so, so if you have an enzyme, a substrate would typically bind here. What a competitive inhibitor would do is it says, okay, I'm going to bind stronger than what this would be. Okay, so kind of clog up the works. It prevents the actual substrate from binding. Okay, by bind by sort of mimicking what's going on with the substrate. Okay. This is, you know, a lot of different um, pharmaceutical drugs, that's what they do. They, they, they target a particular enzyme um, better than what the natural substrate would do it. Okay, you can also have uncompetitive inhibitors where the substrate still binds, but it gets trapped in there. So as, as soon as it's bind, this un, uh, uncompetitive inhibitor comes in and binds something else and traps it within there. It's sort of like somebody walking into a room, and then the uncompetitive inhibitor would shut the door and, lo and lock it. Uh, from the outside, so so this thing can't leave, and so when you do that, the enzyme's stuck. You can't um, get that away. Now the other thing you can do is to be a non-competitive inhibitor, and so that what that happens is it's not going to bind to this particular binding site. It's going to bind to some other binding site. When that binds, it's going to cause a um, it's going to cause a um, the the structure of the protein, the, the secondary and tertiary structure of the enzyme to change. You're going to have this weird allosteric effect um, where it's going to change and it's going to, that's going to prevent the substrate from binding. So it's, it's sort of, um, you know, messing around with the protein over here so something over here doesn't happen. So, so you've got competitive that competes with, it, with the substrate, uncompetitive which traps the substrate, and you have non-competitive which means it's going to another part of the part of the en enzyme. Okay, you can also have irreversible inhibitors, something like that. And so um, this is again where where you get, you know, within the active site, you come in here and you can covalently attach the substrate um, in here the, and deactivate the enzyme because now the natural substrate literally cannot get get in there because this is gummed up. So it's the equivalent of putting gum inside of a inside of a lock. There's nothing. Else. The problem, you could say, these work really, really well. But the problem is, whatever you know, the body or the or the infectious agent or whatever, they can just make more protein, and so you have to. Um, so these can work real well, but but you have to constantly take them because the proteins are constantly getting turned over, and so you have to um, constantly give the um, the inhibitor. So, um, so. For irreversible inhibitors, the classic example is actually the penicillins. Okay, so they they have this um, thiazolidinine ring here, but the important part is really this this lactam here, the cyclic amine. It's sometimes called a beta lactam. This is an incredibly um, this is reactive. What changes between ampicillin and penicillin and amoxicillin and whatever? It's going to be this um, this chain here. With that. So what this does is it block, it reacts with a particular serine inside of this um, glycopeptide um, peptide trans, pepti, um, trans, um, peptidase, okay, and it gums it up, okay. And basically what happens is the, the um, bacteria aren't able to, to um, the, is, go through uh, the, what's it, the, they can't build new cell walls, okay, so they can't multiply. Not, they don't kill it, okay? They just keep it from multiplying. And so the reason why you have to take these for 10 to 12 days is because what it does is it puts a break on those uh, on bacteria from being able to um, to multiply until your until your immune system can catch up, which usually takes about a week or two um, in order to be able to start making antibodies across it. So you sort of put a break on on their ability to to uh, multiply. Until the uh, until your body can can um, fend it off, so like that's you. So penicillins, um, they don't they're not a bactericide. They don't kill it, but they're what's called a bacteriostat. They hold it in place. So so um, for those of you that do um, molecular biology work, where you're moving, where you're working with plasmids that have ampicillin resistance, um, lots of times when you put when you do a transformation, you put the um, plasmid inside of inside of the um, E. coli heat shock, electroporation, whatever, um, with the ampicillin, this is just a special case for ampicillin, when you do that, after you add your growth media, lots of times the procedure will say you have to incubate it for half an hour to an hour and then plate it. With ampicillin, you don't have to do that. 
you can go right from adding the growth media at that specific point, you put it right on the plate, put it in the incubator, it gives you an extra hour, right? So, so extra hour of free time, stuff like that. So it's a nice little, nice little tip, stuff like that. So, okay, good luck.